Thank you so much for coming, everyone. Uh, this is definitely, uh, in my mind, an interesting topic, and I think one that has been covered uh, a whole lot just yet, um, certainly outside of some very specific SIGGRAPH presentations. So hopefully this is something you guys will find interesting, and I'm hoping you'll, you'll come away with some ideas on how you can actually use some of these things in your own work. Uh, so briefly, the topics in this presentation, uh, we're going to go through why you should care about deep learning at all and what it can do for you in your pipelines. Uh, is deep learning good enough? Uh, how does it actually work? Uh, a lot of the time we treat deep learning and machine learning as a bit of a black box. So there's a lot of perception that it's quite inscrutable, quite difficult to control, uh, quite difficult to get our direction out of. Uh, hopefully some of those preconceptions we can work against. And <clears throat> towards the end, we're gonna have some of the more fun meaty bits. Uh, how do I actually use this? How can I get results out of it? What, what do I practically do? Uh, we'll have a little bit of a short overview of what might be coming up next. Uh, gonna touch on, you know, is, is this gonna cost people jobs? Uh, I don't think so, but I think it's a worthwhile conversation to have. And we're gonna have questions at the end, but as Daniel said, uh, if you type up questions into the Q&A as I'm going through, I'll try and pause at the end of some of these sections to uh, answer some of the questions on what's just been covered while that's fresh in people's minds. I will be going quite quickly through all of this just because it's a lot of content to cover. Um, so feel free to take screenshots of slides if, if there's links or information there which uh, you, you want to keep. Otherwise, this will be on YouTube uh, roughly about two weeks after, after this presentation. So you'll be able to freeze frame and hopefully get a little bit more information out of it. Uh, we will probably be a little bit over time, realistically, especially with questions. Uh, but hopefully you guys can stick around and you'll find it useful and informative. So let's get started. Why should I care about deep learning? Uh, for me, the simple answer to this question is it's, it's a case of what have I told you that you can get your computer to make tools for you without ever having to figure out how those tools should actually work. And I guess in some cases that, that can be a bit of a, a worry because if I don't know how this tool works, how to control it, and that's something that we're going to cover. But I think in itself, that's a really fascinating principle. The fact that to solve a problem, you can define what the solution looks like. And as long as you, you're kind of in a situation where you can know the solution, where you see it, uh, the computer will actually then do all the difficult work of figuring out how to make a process that will solve this problem for you. Or to put it another way, if you have uh, two domains, you have a domain A and a domain B, you can create a function that goes from one domain to the other um, through either knowing when it is you're in domain B or having some examples. Like I have a point A and a point B, uh, point A2 and a point B2. I have feed some examples in and then I have a machine learning process that can learn how to go from any given point A to any given point B, again, without having to do any real work yourself. So for example, we have a domain A of sketches of faces, and I want to create a function which goes to domain B, which is photorealistic faces. And this is a function that we can build without having any real needing to have any real knowledge of how rendering works or how muscles work or anatomy or anything like that. We just need enough examples. And you do that on a very broad level by effectively doing this. We take an image from domain A, we take a sketch of a face, we feed it into our AI black box. We run it through some computations in there and we get some image output we compare it against what we want to see. And then we find out how wrong our output is. We measure the 
error or loss? Uh, how, how big of a difference is there between the output we have and what we want to have? And what we do is we take that figure, how big the difference is, we feed it back into our black box and the black box adjusts its computation. And we do this enough times so that eventually we feed our sketch into the black box and it actually gives us the result that we want and we verify it and yeah, this is what we want. And that loss function, the, the amount of error that we've got has reduced uh, to somewhere close to zero. So we're getting the result that we want. And to get good results, we do this a lot of times. Um, to get photorealistic faces, which we are able to generate fairly straightforwardly, none of these faces are real. They're all made by an AI that can run on your computer. We would generate, we do this like 50 million times with a data set of maybe 50,000 faces or something like that. And you, each of these times that we run it, we tune the parameters inside the black box a little bit, and we make this process, this function inside the black box, just a little bit better at doing what we want it to do. So why should you care about deep learning? It's not a magic bullet, but it's something that will get you from point A to point B. Uh, if you have enough examples lying around or Fascinatingly, if you have a good way to get from point B to point A, uh, if you have already a bunch of photorealistic faces, for example, it's a lot easier to write a function that takes a photorealistic face and generates a sketch of it than it is to write a function that generates a photorealistic face from a sketch. So if you've got a bunch of point Bs, and a way to get, go from B to A, this means that you now have an automated way of doing a function that goes from A to B. And if you're a technical artist or a VFX artist, or even more generally a content creator, uh, we're in a very good position uh, that we do tend to have a lot of point Bs lying around. Uh, and we can make a lot of this data procedurally, especially if we're using Houdini or even game engines, which can create a lot of content very quickly. And we're, we tend to be very good at manipulating uh, all of these tools to create that content. And so we can use the tools that we know to create these data sets to create new tools that we wouldn't have been able to make before. And again, like for me, the crux of it, the, the reason why I'm excited about this and I want to talk about it is at the end of the day, this means we can make tools without having to do the hard work of actually making them or figuring out how they need to work. So that leads to then the, the next question is like, okay, that's a cool proposition. Can make tools without having to do the hard work, but is the results are the results actually going to be good enough? And this isn't easy to answer. Um, yeah, kind of. It's, you can get really good results out of deep learning and out of AI models. Um, but it does domain, it depends on the domain you're working in. So one thing that we're actually really good at doing is images. So image upscaling, we can take a low res pixelated image. And there's a bunch of networks like ESR GAN, which will take that image and they'll upscale it. And you can train it on lots of different domains to upscale things in the style of paintings, uh, uh, upscale photos, upscale, uh, pixel art images uh, all in different ways. And we're, we're really good at doing this. Like two, three years at this point, I guess, uh, this would have been a very hard problem. Now it's a really easy problem. And the one thing you'll, you'll notice that a lot of these examples have links at the bottom. Uh, a lot of these models have GitHub repositories. You can go, you can pull them, you can use them right now if you've got the hardware for it. Uh, so, we can do some other cool things with images. Um, this is Scott Eaton's work. He's trained a model to translate from a domain, which is sketches of people to 
uh, domain, which is photos of people that he's taken in his art studio. And he, again, he's curated that data set uh, to have consistent lighting and he's manipulated what the input, what the correlation between the input and the output should be to the point that he can then draw much more abstract or surreal, uh, less realistic uh, sketches of people or organic shapes or even inorganic shapes. And this AI is able to then render these sketches in a way which makes it look like it's all human flesh. And we can generate for realistic faces, um, as I was talking about earlier. For example, one of the ways of doing this is uh, NVIDIA model called StyleGAN, which is able to create stunning amounts of diversity and uh, has lots of parameters for controlling what kinds of faces you want to make. And you, it can do this for different domains. You can train it on cars, you can train it on, uh, lions, horses, and so on. Uh, and it's, it's doing this at 1024 by 1024. The limitation is mostly just how long it takes to train and how much VRAM you've got. So this is, this is high resolution, high quality. A lot of this stuff is indistinguishable from real photos unless you, you really know where to look. And because we can do stuff with uh, images, that means we can do stuff with videos because videos are just sequential images. Uh, so we can do stuff like temporal upscaling, which I suspect you really won't be able to see it much of a difference over a Zoom stream, but the, the right part of this uh, video, uh, the left part of this video rather, I believe is animated on twos and the, the right part is at a smooth 60 frames per second. Mm -hmm. And this is a VFX TD Tiago Porto. He's single-handedly, as far as I'm aware, made an AI face rig for Robert De Niro. So he's got control points that can manipulate Robert De Niro's face using, uh, I believe, just commonly available references of younger De Niro's face. There's been lots of AI attempts to de-age De Niro uh, for... Uh, the Irishman uh, to try and outdo the, the incredibly expensive and complicated effects they actually did for the movie. And for me, this is one of the most impressive ones because this is just an actual AI driven, fully relightable face rig that he's then able to composite back into the movie and get a really good, extremely expressive and controllable effect. Unfortunately, this is one of the few bits of tech which hasn't been shared wildly, wildly. So you, you'll have to uh, contact him if you want more information on how he did it. It's it's pretty awesome. And then besides images, we can do cool things with text. There's um, models like GPT-2 and GPT-3 by OpenAI, which can plausibly generate a lot of text, which is incredibly coherent, um, which is very difficult to tell apart from real text, which is written by a person and can go on for quite a while before it loses coherency. Uh, and then of course, the interesting one is 3D data. Uh, so some of this work is still quite early, but it's already very promising. Um, you have, for example, the model that Facebook has released, and again, this is available online, you can grab it, which will take photos of people, full body photos, and will generate you 3D models. And it's pretty good uh, as long as your input is relatively similar to the domain that they trained it on. Uh, you have to try it with different photos, but for the ones that it works well with, it works really well with. You get clothing wrinkles, you get a lot of detail. It's, it's all very, um, very cogent. And you have things working with point clouds, for example. So you can have a point cloud completion where you go the model goes in and fills in gaps in your point cloud data. Like if you're using LIDAR in a film set, for example, uh, maybe there's something that, that would be useful in those kinds of conditions where you're, you've got complicated occlusions that you're not capturing under, but you can auto complete that data and fill it in. Um, so in short, is deep learning good enough? Well, if you're working with images, it's getting really good. And I'd argue in a lot of cases, they're production level good, or at least 
the results that would be useful in production. And we can make temporally consistent sequences of images for video. Uh, text generation is a little bit outside of the scope of this talk because there's a lot of people trying to do artificial general intelligence through uh, that whole approach. So it's, it's a whole different kind of crazy. And I don't have any examples here, but audio synthesis, there's things like MuseNet, Jukebox AI, um, that's also getting into a really good position. And 3D isn't there yet, but it's probably going to get better really quick. Like the idea of generating photorealistic faces in to the quality that StyleGAN does it would have been fairly unthinkable three years ago, but then two years ago, StyleGAN just went up and did it. And now there's lots of different ways of doing it and lots of ways of controlling it. Everyone's doing research about how to then improve it and get more data out of it and more fidelity. It's the, the level of development in the field is very, very high and the velocity is super fast. Uh, so that's that's hopefully the the selling pitch here, basically. Uh, you the reason deep learning uh, is something you should be interested in is because it lets you make tools without having to do the hard work of making them. And hopefully this is kind of a good enough illustration of the fact that you can already actually get some pretty good results. Uh, I'm just going to see if there's any questions at the moment. Uh, what's the most exciting thing you've done with deep learning? Uh, is there something you'd like to do just for fun? Uh, so the most exciting thing that I've done with deep learning, you will come to that in a little bit. So uh, that's if you stick around until until the end, that's when we'll actually get into some of the really juicy examples. And what is deep learning? We're going. That's the next bit, in fact. So, what's in the black box? Uh, so, I'll try and go through this quickly just because properly uh, dismantling all of the stuff that we're going to be talking about and going through it in detail would probably take at least the whole hour by itself when we want to actually get to the, to the fun bits of what you can do with it. Uh, this is the most technical portion of the presentation. So if you don't follow for a little bit, I don't think that matters too much. Um, Effectively, my, my view in this is that we're the FX artists and we're technical artists. We're not researchers, we're not data scientists. A with a lot of this stuff, I think it's really good to understand some of the low level things that are going on in principle, but it, also it's okay to let others do the tinkering and focus on the high level work. Like the, it's, it's optional. Like, it can be useful to write a game engine from scratch, but you don't need to do that in order to do tech art. And if you're a VFX artist, you want to have some idea of how fluid simulations work and what the parameters are that you're changing on them. But like, you don't need to know the Navier-Stokes equations by heart. Uh, it's, it's, it's optional. It'll give you more depth and understanding and potentially let you do more stuff, but you can do amazing things without really knowing how these things work. So I'm going to skip through a lot of this stuff fairly quickly in the interest of time, but you'll be able to go back through the slides and um, hopefully I'll give you a good introduction to more in-depth resources if you really want to start understanding what's going on under the hood. So when we talk about deep learning, uh, generally it's, we're talking about neurons and this is already kind of a good start from misconceptions because it, in real life, neurons are biological mechanisms which are still fairly poorly understood and they're a lot more complicated than what we're doing uh, in deep learning, where when we talk about neurons, it's actually incredibly basic linear math. So the building block is, um, this, this has been around for decades. Uh, one term for it is a perceptron when it's a uh, single, uh, mechanism by itself, but colloquially when we start stringing them together, we refer to them as neurons. It's got multiple inputs and a single output, and the inputs are passing some float values into it. And the objective is for it to then produce a float value that it passes out. 
And all it's really doing is it's taking all of the inputs and it's summing them. Uh, and it's multiplying each input by its own value, which is called a weight, the weight of that particular input. So it's multiplying them, then summing them. Uh, at the end, it adds a bias. And finally, uh, and this is where AI research, I think, tends to trip up people from other industries, uh, especially from ours, because there's a lot of new terms which sound a little bit scary uh, and somewhat inscrutable, but a lot of the time they're actually talking about very obvious things that we've been doing all the time. And this is one of them, like there's an activation function and the most common one is RELU, which stands for Rectified Linear Unit, uh, which is actually just a max function, which if you've done you know, any kind of vex scripting shader math any kind of math really you, you'll you'll know what it's doing so a perceptron is just taking the sum of all these weighted inputs it's adding a bias and then if the result is less than zero it's returning zero and if the the result is greater than zero you're just getting a linear function uh going upwards at whatever the specific uh gradient is and that's pretty much it, like for the most part. Um, some terminology, uh, the weights and biases on each neuron are called the parameters. So uh, these parameters can be tuned to then generate a different output at the end. And when we talk about a neural network, we're talking about a set of neurons which are all connected to each other in some way. And each neuron has its weights and a bias and then an activation function. <clears throat> and how they're all connected to each other, how many neurons they are, is called the neural network. And a specific set of tuned parameters for that network is called a model. And one thing that's really important to remember is that the same neural network can be trained on different data sets to produce different models with different weights and biases which will give you different results. Like you can train the same image to image neural network uh, to take sketches and produce images of cats. And you can train it to take sketches and produce images of trains. And the, the architecture of that is gonna be the same. It's gonna have the same number of parameters. The difference is gonna be is that the values of the parameters are gonna be different. Uh, they're gonna be two different models which you can substitute. <laughs> And to really get your hands uh, dirty and play around with this a little bit, uh, my recommendation would be playground.tensorflow.org, which is a really neat, very lightweight web app, which lets you play around with uh, very small neural networks. And what you see here, so where it's talking about neurons, these these are literally the, the kinds of things we've just been talking about. So you know what this is doing. It's taking all of these inputs. And in fact, the visualization here is showing you kind of what the weight of these inputs are based on whether they're thicker or thinner. And it's adding them up. And what you're seeing here is this is basically trying to train a classifier. So we have a data set, which is yellow points and blue points. And our input is literally just the X coordinate from minus six to six and the Y coordinate from minus six to six. And what we're trying to do here is train a model over successive iterations where it tries to evaluate the output of this network to then predict based on the coordinate, uh, should our output be yellow or blue? Um, or I guess internally it's probably just gonna be minus one or one. And the more, the more of these steps that we add, like initially they're very simple linear functions, but as we start layering them up, it can produce more and more complicated shapes for us. And in this case, this model is kind of not quite powerful enough. So if we then add a few more neurons to the end here, and we just again do the same training and we're trying to just reduce the error function uh, which is how well it's predicting uh, for our data set whether it should be blue or yellow 
uh, all of this really simple linear maths that's literally not doing any more maths than what I've just shown you is just uh, summing all of those inputs, adding weights and biases. Uh, we can tune those parameters and eventually get a function which uh, gives us a spiral shape which corresponds to the data we've got. And it's even doing a little bit of extrapolation, like it's, it's sort of guessing that probably the spiral is going to keep on spiraling, uh, that kind of stuff. It's very simple. It's very basic stuff at, at its fundamental level. So then it kind of comes up with a question of, if it's so basic, why does it work so well for the most part? And the really key secret source is something called backpropagation. And what backpropagation is doing is it's taking that loss function, the, the value which represents how big the error is, and it's saying the purpose of this uh, function is to drive that value as low as possible. We're trying to get it to zero where there's no error at all. And the, the key thing is that all of this really simple maths is also very easily differentiable. So what we can do is we say, well, the gradient that we want here is for, it, for this value to go downwards. And we can use differentiation to then figure out for all of the variables on our first, or on our last rather layer of neurons, we can say, well, for this value, for this value to go down, that means the parameters on this one have to go down, the parameters on this one have to go up, and these are gradients, so they're telling us approximately by how much as well. So we, we get these gradients, that means we can then generate a new model where we've shifted these parameters along those gradients uh, in all these different directions, and then when we run it again, hopefully our loss is going to be lower and then we can do that again. And the reason it's called backpropagation is that we can then actually backpropagate through the whole network and we can calculate uh, the gradients for every single parameter on all of these neurons. So each weight and each bias on each neuron, we get a gradient for it. How much do we need to tweak this by to make this loss value go down? And as you can see, over time, we start getting this sort of spiky graph where overall the loss value actually goes down as we uh, tweak the parameters by these gradients. And it's not a linear process. We don't necessarily have a guarantee that we're going to find uh, the absolute best combination of parameters. There's lots of different ways of trying to find that. But that's, that's the process by which we can actually try and get a good result. So a different way of thinking about it is imagine a game where you're trying to hit a specific spot with a cannon, like those old flash games uh, or angry birds for that matter. And in this, it's really simple. You've got two parameters you're trying to tune, the angle and the power of the cannon so that the trajectory hits your target. And the way you're doing it in this case is effectively you're, you're shooting the cannon and then you miss but you get an idea of whether you should be increasing or decreasing the angle of the cannon, adding or removing the power. So you, you, you tweak your angle, you tweak your power, and then you shoot again, and then you miss again, but you'll be a little bit closer and you'll be like, aha, so now I need to tweak it a little bit less up, uh, a little bit more power, and then you shoot. Maybe you'll miss again, but you, you get closer to the answer. So it's just, it's a way of, for two for two parameters or for a single parameter you could sort of uh, plot it on a graph and see yeah hey here's my global minimum uh, I found the best possible answer with the parameters I've got uh, you've got local minima which you want to try and avoid but effectively at every point you're just sampling what's the gradient and then you're moving along that gradient and the difference with the neural network is that this is effectively all it's doing, but it's trying to tune millions of parameters at the same time. And that's the main reason why we've only now really got this big boom of uh, neural networks and AI tech, because a lot of this math has been around for decades, but it's only really now that we've got the, the actual hardware and the computational power to, to run it. Uh, so 
adding deep layers, uh, adding more of these connected layers of neurons increases the complexity of achievable cal calculations. Uh, all of the mass that we're adding is differentiable and whatever we're using as the loss function needs to be differentiable as well. And then as long as we can differentiate that loss function, whether it's just comparing the two images and seeing how different the pixels are, if we're doing something more complicated, uh, we can then back propagate, find the gradient for each parameter that will reduce the loss. And by moving each parameter along that gradient, uh, we'll get a new set of parameters, a new model that will have a smaller loss when we evaluate it against the same test set. Uh, the learning rate uh, that you can then adjust during, during training is how far you're moving down that gradient. Uh, if you move too little, then you might get stuck in a local minimum. If you move too far, then you might skip over the solution and end up careening back the other way. Uh, so over time, we reduce the learning rate and the loss gets smaller and smaller and smaller, which means our result gets closer and closer to what it should be and we get better quality out of the neural network. And that's called the process of gradient descent. And that's how, that's effectively what most training in machine learning and in deep learning rather is doing. And another interesting question to ask is, why does it work so well on images? So in the example with the spiral, we were using fully connected layers. So at the start, every neuron sees every neuron uh, from the previous layer and it's got weights for all of them. Uh, but if we actually got as the input, not just uh, an X position and a Y position, but we've got several million different pixel values. What we might wanna do is uh, decide that the first layer actually has to have the same number of neurons as pixels. Uh, and as inputs, we don't feed all of the image in as an input to every single neuron, but only the adjacent pixels to the pixel that neuron corresponds to. And what this means is actually we've built a convolutional filter, uh, which you guys might be familiar with uh, from image processing. This is the idea that we can scan through an image and we sample uh, the pixel that we're scanning, but we're also sampling the adjacent pixels. And we have a convolutional filter, which is uh, values for, you know, how much we want to multiply each pixel by, and then we add them up to get the value for this pixel that we're scanning through. Uh, this is something that you'll recognize from Gaussian blur, edge detect, emboss. Uh, they're all convolutional filters where we just have this preset three by three filter. And this maths you'll notice is the same maths as a perceptron. It's, it's adding things up after they've been multiplied by their own weights. And the difference is that we don't just run one filter over the image, we run many. So we run edge detection filters, but we run, you know, uh, filters which detect horizontal edges, filters which run, uh, detect vertical edges, diagonals, and so on. And then we run more convolutional filters over the output of those filters. So you'll then have a convolutional filter, which is actually combining the results of filters that have detected horizontal, vertical, diagonal edges to create a filter which maybe detects circles because it sees there's a combination of those edges. And we don't have to program any of this in because this is all part of the neural network. So all of this stuff gets differentiated and tuned. So all that we're doing is we're creating a network architecture which says, hey, let's do 64 filters on the input, uh, which are all just three by three kernels. Uh, but the contents of those kernels of the convolutional filters actually gets tuned as we start training. And then we just naturally see it optimize itself when we start seeing that some of these filters are detecting horizontal edges, some of these filters are detecting vertical edges, and you get these natural hierarchies forming. It's crazy fascinating. So all of the contents of these filters are still just the weights and biases parameters. They're still effectively neurons. And what we're doing uh, is effectively, we start with a full resolution image and 
each of the filters that we're applying to it is effectively a detection for a particular kind of feature. So in the first level, the feature would be diagonal lines or horizontal lines. But then the second level feature, what we'll do is we'll reduce the resolution of the image and we'll start sampling the results of the previous filters. So then you have higher order features being detected like if two of these layers have detected a diagonal line and a horizontal line, then there's going to be a filter here which gets activated when it sees the diagonal line or horizontal line. So it's like, aha, there's an angle. And you basically, you keep increasing the number of features and decreasing the resolution until you end up with a vector. And this vector is just the, the one dimensional uh, representation of all of the features that you had in the original image. And this is how, in this case, we're, this is a really simple network for classification of handwritten numbers. Uh, at the end, you can just read this vector. We, we end up with a vector of just 10 values and we can read from these 10 values, uh, which number is it based on which value is the most activated because that was the loss function when we were training this model. And effectively, this means that, uh, particularly when solving classification problems, uh, this is basically a kind of compression, right? Uh, and it's the way we're doing this is also loosely based on experimental evidence of how actual sight perception works, where they monitored what neurons in cats' brains are doing when they're looking at images. So it's, it's all relatively based on biology. And the really cool thing is we can actually then run backwards through this process. So when we've taken an image and we've encoded it into a vector, which represents what are the features of that image, we can then go backwards and decompress it and generate images. And if we stick some of these networks together and we can ensure that images from different domains compress into the same vector domain, that means that we can convert from one domain into another. So effectively what we're doing is we're saying like, hey, here's a sketch, let's compress it into a vector. And the feature vector is just saying like, well, there's two eyes and a mouth. And then we have another network which has been trained to decompress from the domain of how many eyes, how many mouths is there, but it's been trained to create photorealistic images. So that takes the same data and gives us a photorealistic image. This is effectively what's, what's going on under the hood. So what's going on in the black box? Um, really simple linear maths, convolution filters, Millions of tunable parameters. Uh, there's enough maths that we know effectively the, the ideal solution exists somewhere. Like we know that there's less computation in principle required to achieve the output than what we've got in there. The challenge is just finding what's the actual correct uh, combination of values that will give us the output that we want, uh, finding the correct path through uh, millions of parameters. And then we use differentiation to let us iteratively try to find that best value for all these parameters. And at the end, we get really good uh, image results. So that's, that's, that's the complicated technical bit uh, out of the way. I, I appreciate I probably went through that quite quickly. Uh, let's see if there's any good uh, questions. I can answer at the moment. Uh, differentiation is in calculus? Yes. Um, when I'm talking about differentiation is literally the ability to take a function which produces a value uh, from some inputs and then being able to get the gradient, like based on if I toggle this input, is this value actually increasing or decreasing with respect to this input? So if you've got a uh, one dimensional curve, if I'm going up along X and I'm currently, uh, I'm currently at this point, is X gonna increase or is X gonna decrease? Uh, does the compression method used in the image affect how deep learning works? Yes, it does. Um, it's generally quite important um, to curate effectively what, what your inputs are because it starts by looking at the image in fairly, you know, pixel by pixel uh, kind of um, analysis. So if you've got JPEG compression versus lossless images, uh, 
at the kind of the, the micro level when you go in pixel by pixel, these images will look quite different. Uh, I think things like anti-aliasing will make a difference as well because you're gonna have jagged edges in one case and smooth edges in another case. So if you're using, uh, for example, an image upscaling network that's been trained on videos and you're trying to upscale um, non-anti-aliased CGI, it's going to give you slightly weird results because it doesn't know how to deal with jagged edges. It's never seen jagged edges before. Uh, is there an aspect of regression going on here? Um, depends what you mean. Uh, in, in a way, I think gradient descent is a type of uh, statistical uh, regression analysis, possibly, if, if that's what you mean. Uh, and Kevin Nally asks, how is the system defining an incorrect or correct result and feeding the info back into itself? So that's a good point. Um, this depends on the network architecture and the training model that you're using. Uh, effectively, this is what we're talking about when we say loss function. And generally here, I've been saying loss function quite generally. Uh, one form of doing a loss function is you can take the output and the target, and you can subtract every pixel from every pixel, and then you can sum that up. So you get the total difference between these two images. And that's called L1 loss. That's the simplest loss function. So you get just what's the average difference between the pixel values. And that's then that value you can try to propagate back with the idea in mind that, you know, at, at the end of the day, a perfect uh generation function will give you two identical images so there's not going to be any difference that value is going to be zero uh that's that's not usually as useful as you'd think it would be uh, just because this kind of loss function doesn't mandate the images to be correct it just mandates the values to be correct so you generally get very blurry results when it tries to optimize for l1 loss and there's a few different other ways of doing it most commonly is to actually use another neural network which is a classification network which detects for example eyes eyes noses ears colors things like that um, because neural networks are differentiable you can use them as loss functions and then you can actually test that the output that you're creating has the same high level features as your target image and you can back propagate that loss. Is there an optimization process where you eventually try to reduce the number of layers once you've got figured out to reduce computation in the future? Uh, yes, this is something that's doable. Um, generally when I don't know if there's an automated way of doing this just yet, but it is something that AI researchers usually do. Uh, you'll do a process of ablation where you show like, oh, I can re remove these values or I can remove these values and either it makes the result worse or it doesn't change the result. So there's, yeah, there's definitely a lot of optimization you can do and that's a whole separate value, a uh, whole separate discussion to be had. Uh, it's generally more important if you then want to actually deploy these networks to uh, clients' devices if you want to use them at runtime. In this case, since I'm mostly talking about very experimental stuff for tooling, uh, most of the things I'm talking about here, they a single inference executes like in under a second. So I think for tooling, it's not as important, but it's definitely something that's possible to do. So I'll move on. So can I use this? And the resounding answer for me is yes. End of presentation. No, I'm kidding. Um, yes, you. the real requirements are that you should ideally know some Python. And that's why I think uh, tech artists, VFX artists, uh, we who use a lot of Python with uh, DCC tools and for building pipelines, we're ideally situated to take advantage of a lot of this stuff because we were kind of familiar with a lot of the um, things that AI researchers are using anyway. And you want to have a good GPU on hand, which most of us also do. Um, they're not strict requirements because there's also web tools that you can be using. There's uh, Google Code Colab, which uh, lets you 
temporarily hook into a Google GPU on the cloud for free. <laughs> so you can run networks on that and run inference and maybe a little bit of training. There's time limits on it, but you know, can't, can't argue with free. Um, ideally, if you're just getting into it, I'd suggest getting a little bit familiar with Anaconda, which is a really good way of setting up lots of different Python environments with the different and often uh, conflicting uh, requirements that neural network uh, Python scripts often have. And another thing is to <clears throat> get familiar with tensor operations. So if, if you know how Python slices arrays, uh, a tensor is effectively an n-dimensional matrix. So you can have an array, uh, an array of arrays, which will give you a two-dimensional matrix, and then tensors are a NumPy standard for dealing with n-dimensional matrices, which is effectively what we're dealing with when we're doing all this kind of uh, convolution and feature reduction. So knowing, knowing tensor operations is probably one of the most useful things. And it's not really that hard. It's basically uh, Python array slicing in multiple, multiple dimensions. So there's two popular APIs, uh, TensorFlow and PyTorch. Uh, I think TensorFlow is more Google aligned. PyTorch, I think, is more Facebook aligned. Um, but they're, they're both open and free for everyone to use. And if you've got a GPU, if you've got CUDA installed, Importantly, it has to be an NVIDIA GPU. I think at the moment there's relatively little support for uh, AMD GPUs. Uh, they, will, they will go really, really quickly then. Um, but you can technically still do inference on your CPU. The, the APIs are really good in that sort of sense. The compatibility is being maximized, um, which is also means that they now both work under Windows and they have really good tutorials now, which was not the case two years ago or three years ago, rather. So how do I make cool and useful things with it? Uh, the one problem with uh, the tutorials for the actual APIs is they'll generally start out with really simple stuff. It's the DirectX equivalent of you know rendering a uh, RGB triangle, um, doing things like uh, classifying handwritten digits, which is still amazing. It was still been really difficult to do that by yourself like five years ago. But uh, since we're VFX and technical artists, we want to do some shiny, cool things. So I'd recommend doing that, doing some tutorials, but then also start looking at GitHub and at new research, because many researchers share their code not long after publication, and they will often share their models so that other people can replicate their results. And you should get also the training code so you can train your own models with your own data. NVIDIA has recently experimented Imaginaire, which is a really good library which collects several of their image models. They've got paired image translation, unpaired image translation, and they've also even got temporally coherent video translation uh, networks all in there. And they've got tutorials, so you can just download, follow the tutorials, and it'll tell you how to generate your own images, how to train your own models with it, all of that stuff. It's a really good starting point. Um, also by NVIDIA, uh, a little bit older, uh, pix to pix HD, uh, which was one of the first high definition uh, paired image translation algorithms, which most of what I'm going to be talking about is going to be using effectively. The reason I'm saying to use this one, because uh, pix to pix HD is actually in Imaginaire as well, but the difference is that Imaginaire is under a non commercial license, so you can use it for RD only. Um, pix to pix HD, they actually sneakily released under an MIT license, you can use it commercially um, if you find some use in it. So, um, but it's a slightly older code base, so it needs a little bit of tweaking to get it all running properly, especially on Windows. But they're both both really good starting points, and they're all incredibly powerful network architectures, which means that with the right training set, you can get really good models and really good results from them. Uh, and then there's other models, which most of these have already come up in the beginning when I was talking about them, but uh, StyleGAN, which is the poster child of photorealistic faces, uh, they've recently released StyleGAN to Ada, 
um, which has some enhancements, which allows it to work really well on smaller data sets. Before you need tens of thousands, now you can get pretty good results, even if your data set only has a few thousand or maybe even a few hundred images, which is amazing. And then there's you know, the upscaling, the video interpolation, the text generation. Uh, there's a stylized VFX uh, network, which actually applies stylization to volumes, which has a Houdini plugin by Penelope Tay, which you, you can actually you know, use to stylize your Houdini sims. Uh, and then there's free web apps. Uh, there's some for text. And if you haven't seen Artbreeder, that's a really good way of starting to play around with this. So Artbreeder wraps around StyleGAN and StyleGAN isn't a paired image translation algorithm. Effectively, what it does, it ju just says, like, we're starting out with this feature vector, and I want this feature vector to represent as many images in this domain, such as faces, as possible. So if you load it up, you literally have, like, a real-time control, so you can go and start tweaking parameters of this feature vector, and it'll render them how how it interprets they should be rendered. So you can start manipulating age, gender, ethnicity. As long as you know which parameters in this vector to tweak, you can resolve that vector into a face, whatever that face may be. Uh, this is extremely powerful. And in principle, you can apply it to uh, anything else. Uh, as a very recent example, I had to go at taking a database of whole bunch of our concept art for Sea of Thieves, and then training a style GAN network to generate new fake Sea of Thieves concept art. And this is this is maybe only like a couple of thousand different items, but it actually does a really good job of creating completely new Sea of Thieves items. If you look closely, you can see that you know they're obviously not real concept art, but uh, especially if there's something that you want to help artists with, or you want to just fill out more content for something, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, but then the main thing I'm going to be talking about, and I think this is where at the moment the most use for us is, just because 3D comic creation isn't quite there yet, is the things that we can do with paired images. And I think why I'm talking, one of the reasons why I'm talking about this now as well is because ultimately I think a lot of this thinking is going to be applicable to 3D data and all the things we'll be doing with that. But also because there's, as you see towards the end, we do use images in 3D content as well. And we use 2D images for VFX as well. And obviously, if you're working in film VFX, your end output is a 2D image. So having 2D tools is actually quite important, quite useful. So with paired data sets, there's a class of problems that paired image training is particularly well suited for solving. Uh, that's when you have a complex process that can generate high fidelity images, even if you're just grabbing them off Google, that's a complex process. Uh, this process is difficult to control or slow or expensive. And you wanna get high fidelity images with a lot of control and minimum effort. And what you can do is if you can get those high fidelity images, if you can generate from those images, low fidelity images, like going from photorealistic faces to sketches, and if you can then choose in the low fidelity images to have just the data that you want to have control over, whether that's color or shape or I don't know, hairstyle shape and, whatever, then this is a blueprint for creating a data set, which you can then use to go from the low fidelity images back to the high fidelity images. So this is the fun bit, actual, um, actual examples. Uh, so this is using Pixabix HD. Uh, this is something I was doing two years ago when I was first diving into this. Let's do a data set of Sea of Thieves pirates. Uh, on Sea of Thieves, we had a character creation uh, system which is called the Infinite Pirate Generator. And we don't really have a lot of controls for actually manipulating how the pirate looks. We just have defined uh, a bunch of uh, boundaries for different parameters, and we just generate randomized pirates based on those boundaries. So it's easy for me to generate thousands of pirates but getting specific results is hard. 
Uh, and in this case, I actually found another neural network, which is a photo sketch for converting these pirate portraits, which are just rendered out of Unreal. I just literally set up a blueprint with a camera and some lights. Um, and it gives me these really shitty back of a pub napkin drawn in a blurry Sharpie sketches of these pirates. So what I wanted to see was, can I train Pixabix HD to go from really horribly bad pirate sketches to actual prophecy of these pirates? And the answer actually is yes. In fact, really, really well. And in a way, it's not surprising because if you look at the other stuff that Bixbix HD has done, it's it's done a lot of this kind of stuff already. It's it, it can do this quite easily. So then the bigger test is, does this generalize? Uh, how much has it actually learned about the correlation between the sketches and the pirates and how much has it just memorized the training set? So if we take some photos and turn those into sketches and see what happens, oh, well, that's not very good. Uh, that's not a particularly good result. It's all muddy and kind of indistinct. And given how good the training set pirates were, this is maybe a little bit surprising. And this, I think, is, is the interesting part, because when, when you do this, obviously, you've got a black box. So you're sitting there like, what do I do now? How do I improve this? I can't go and improve my algorithm. I don't know what the bloody hell my algorithm is. So can we do something about it? And I think this is one of the, one of the main takeaways that, that I've had from this is we can do something about it. And the way, the way we work with these results is by looking at the training data because the data set is how we're defining the function. So if we look more closely at our training data and what the results in the training set are, we'll actually notice that it's a bit too good. We have black and white sketches and I'm not 100% sure. I think the images on the in the middle are the AI generated ones and the images on the right are the games ones. Or, no, it's no, I think it's the other way around. Yeah, it's the other way around. Uh, but they're very difficult to tell apart and they've even got the hair color correct, which that shouldn't be possible. We're feeding in a black and white image. Uh, so there must be uh, some correlation that the model can find between the sketch and the final image, or else maybe it's just memorizing the data set uh, that we, we can't see. So my solution to this was to actually introduce more randomness to the data set to try and break the correlation between the sketch and the final output. So the second approach to this was to actually in Unreal, where I've got this blueprint that's rendering out my pirates, uh, for each pirate, I've decided to do one nice looking output, which has the proper photo studio lighting, and one output which has randomized lighting. So the sketch is actually generated from the randomized lighting, which means uh, we now have a much more chaotic input. Like some of these sketches don't have eyes because the eyes are in shadow. Some of these sketches have shadows where there shouldn't be shadows, uh, things like that, that force a harder problem onto the AI model. And then adding also things like more camera variation, camera FOV variation, more random hats and accessories and rotations and things like that. And then, it, so if we look at the training data, uh, now we're starting to see some interesting results. Like it's no longer as good at guessing colors. Um, it will sometimes get different skin tones, it'll get different hair colors, it'll get uh, different clothing colors. It's still maybe a little bit better than it should be, uh, which is some of it might just be correlations uh, that are baked into our item assets because we're not randomly varying the colors of hats for the most part, for example. And some hair colors might be associated with specific uh, hairstyles. So it's looking at some of that. Uh, but we do now see a lot more variation between the real images and the fakes. And the models become much more robust because it's had to deal with lossier, less correlated demo data, rather. So does that generalize? Well, this is what we had before. And that's what we get with the new data set. So 
it's actually now a lot better. And it's not perfect, but that's a big improvement. And I think that's a really good example of how you can actually work with the data set to then keep refining and improving your output, especially when you have the ability to fully generate your own data set, which um, we often do have that ability. Uh, the biggest point of failure here is just the model struggles with tall foreheads because all Sea of Thieves pirates have really short foreheads. So when it sees a forehead, it's like, shouldn't there be like a hairline or a hat here or something? This is natural. And in fact, this generalizes even to other hand-drawn images too. And I'm not going to show the sources uh, just because I don't want to be accused of any copyright infringement. Uh, but you, you, you can definitely do all kinds of characters and all kinds of sketches with this. It becomes a really robust model. So I'm going to I appreciate that we're starting to run low on time. So I'm going to start skipping ahead to through the fun bits and then we'll take questions at the end. So the next question is, what if you want more control? Like in this case, we've actually made a portrait generator, which is intentionally robust at the expense of control. Like if I give it a character which doesn't have a nose or a mouth, it's going to fill in a nose and a mouth because it's learned to reconstruct data from uh, missing information because that's the data set we've given it, which is intentionally lossy. But that means that if I wanted a pirate which doesn't have a nose and a mouth, it's not actually capable of making me one. So we can fine tune this relationship a lot by controlling how we generate the sketch from the render. So now if we want to have something which is a bit more controllable, which maybe we want artists to use as a way of helping them create concept art, we can have a look at how they want to control the end result based on how they draw sketches. So it might be something like uh, using lines. How do they use lines? What do they indicate? In this case, we can see it's creases or boundaries between objects. Uh, we can see that mass is defined by flat color. And yes, I'm, I'm totally stealing uh, a lot of these ideas from uh, Scott Eaton's work with, with his sketches, uh, but on, on a budget. We, we don't have a photo studio, so we're, we're just using some ZBrush models, as you'll see. Uh, distance might be indicated by tone. And what we can start doing is making a data set from those relationships. So we've got some zebra sculpts. We can stick them into a virtual photo studio in Houdini, and we can render out a few thousand of these uh, just randomly posed, rotated, uh, and so on. But because it's a virtual photo studio, we don't have to stick with just the uh, RGB outputs. We can render out a few other masks, like a fall-off map or a depth map. And so then what we do is the depth map is already giving us the sort of uh, result where uh, further away means lighter tones, but we don't want artists to be using precise pixel values to control depth. So uh, we can quantize the depth map, for example, so that the model has to learn to work with incomplete depth data. Uh, this means the artist can suggest relationships in depth, but they're not being precise about it. And the big question is, what's the meaning of a black line? Again, we can take the RGB data and we can do an edge detect, but that means that black lines are picking out areas of RGB contrast specifically, which is dependent on lighting and surface color and all of these other factors. Uh, maybe we we'll want to do something different with black lines. Maybe if we want to do creases, we can take the fall off map that we've generated and we could do an edge detect on that, in which case the relationship between the black line and the end result is strictly that it's curvature away from camera. And then the artist doesn't have to worry about where the shadows are gonna be falling in the final product. They can just be focusing on the geometry and the model will take care of the lighting. So the end result is if we generate those kinds of model those kinds of uh, sketches, uh, we can train a model that we can, the artist can give a sketch that looks like this to the model and it'll actually generate something that looks almost like a 3D render with lighting and shadows, which the artist can then use as a basis to paint over and then do more work on. And again, this generalizes to a whole bunch of 
different types of sketches. And in this case, we're, we're trying to create uh, silly creatures. And then the, the really fun bit is, uh, I mean, so far until now, this has all been generating 2D images, but what if we want to create data which we actually can use in 3D um, in real time or in VFX? Uh, well, we use a lot of 2D data, but a lot of the time it's not just RGB 2D data. We have normal maps, alpha channels, and things like that. And the really cool thing about these networks is that there's not actually any real limit on how many channels you can have in your input or your output. Uh, like for various reasons, a lot of these uh, networks are actually designed to work with hundreds of input channels because that's how they do uh, semantic maps. They, they split them out each into their own uh, channel. And I mean, fair warning, there's usually some small Python tweaks in terms of how you want to be packing and unpacking data if you want to uh, do these kinds of things with the off-the-shelf networks like Bix, Bix HD. But it's it's not a massive amount of work. And it's also worth mentioning that you know the, the Python code that we're talking about these things is actually, you'd be surprised at how small it is. Like, Pixbix HD is like maybe a couple thousand lines in total between the data loaders and the model jet definition and so on. It's really not difficult to start digging into it, even if, like me, you went into it not really understanding how a lot of it works. It's you you can just start digging through it and get get the hang of it and get it working. And a lot of the problems you'll find are super stack overflowable. So uh in, in Houdini, in SideFX Labs, there's a, a really useful tool which is designed for packing uh, PyroFX explosions a, into a 2D format, which uh, is readable by, for example, Unreal Engine. Uh, what you do is you render out, you, you simulate your pyro effect, uh, your pyro explosion in Houdini, and this tool will automatically do renders to get you the heat map, the normal map, and the density or alpha map. And you can save out a sprite sheet of all of these channels into Unreal, import it. And then on a particle system, you can use all of this data to relight your explosion. Uh, and you can use the heat map to add some color and you can use the normal map to light the smoke and do all of these kinds of effects. And this is a really good way of doing explosions in, in real time. So you're basically just caching out the simulation to two dimensional data. And that's cool and a lot of people use it. So one thing that I was thinking about, and this was specifically for for this talk back in March is like, hey, can we actually generate some of this data using AI? So, you know, say I want to just, I don't want to run the simulation. I just want to give it uh, the silhouette that I want of what the expression should look like. And my target is to generate this heat map and the output normals and the output alpha channel, which I'll then be able to use to render this explosion in, in Unreal. And one thing I realized quite quickly is that, well, this is actually more of like a video problem. So I want it to be temporally coherent. So uh, the input needs to not just be the silhouette, but let's also pump in the previous frames channels. So I've got five channels as my input here, right? I've got the uh, desired silhouette. I've got the previous frames heat, the previous frames normals, that's two channels and then the previous frames alpha. And this is what we want to get. So it's five channels in, four channels out. And it turns out it's actually quite good at this. Um, I mean, it would probably be better if we weren't generating lots of different channels. Um, like when we're missing some of this bubbly structure of the explosion, for example. And some of this might be just due to the fact that the training set for this is actually quite small. Um, and we didn't have a whole lot of time to train it either, but it's it's giving us the kind of data that we want. Like this is definitely a normal map and it looks quite sensible. And this is definitely uh, an alpha map and it looks quite sensible. So that means that, you know, we can do some hand painted animation of what we want the shape of the explosion to be over a timeline and then just convert it into the data that we need to render it in real time. And then the next problem uh, is, of course, that, um, well, 
if we're doing this at 30 frames per second, we need like several hundred frames and our VFX artists aren't trained to deanimate it. So um, we need to interpolate these frames. But I mean, we, we've got video generation networks available to us as well, which, which tackle temporal consistency. But in this case, it's like, well, animation is still just a paired image problem, right? Either I have an animation frame as an input, so please make me the next frame, which is kind of what we're already doing. Or it's like, I have two animation frames as an input, uh, please make me the in-between. And this is what we ended up doing. So for this next bit, I actually ended up training two uh, AI models, one of which is taking the five uh, channels of input and giving four channels out. And another one, which is actually taking eight channels of input, which is the uh, all of the data for one frame and all of the data for another frame, and then generating four channels output, which is the in-between frame. <clears throat> and so that means we can do something like this. We can do some really badly drawn sketches of what uh, a skull-shaped explosion should look like then we can convert these frames and then we can interpolate between these frames. And we actually get a sprite sheet, which is, looks pretty plausible in terms of the, uh, the heat intensity and the normals and the alpha. And if we then composite all of this the correct way, we get something which I'll admit it's not good at uh, necessarily keeping the precise details of the skull, but is definitely following the shapes we've set out. And more importantly, this is a paired image um, conversion network, but it's actually learned the flow and motion of a pyro sim. Like this, this isn't a step by step by step uh, frame based animation. This this looks fluid, and it's generally has the kind of behavior you want. And this is again super small training set, not a lot of training time. There's a lot of scope for then improving the result of this. So can you use this, like, can you find a good use for it? I think the power is very much there and it's not 100% accurate, but I think there's a lot of things already that this might be good enough. Uh, and it's a black box, but you can control its behavior. And if it doesn't work, you can make it better. And the off the shelf tools that are available are just gonna keep on improving. So I think a lot of these principles are going to become more and more relevant in coming years. Uh, and yeah, this is a field that's advancing really quickly. Um, the new big thing is differentiable rendering. So we can actually use rendering as a loss function now. So we can do things like uh, tuning outputs um, of models or textures to then match a 3D rendered thing and match its uh, physical material and shape properties and things like that. Uh, there's starting to be more and more papers that are doing this kind of thing. And yeah, I think there's clear applications. It's got rough edges. We can improve and iterate on the results. And we have the power to generate bigger and better data sets when we're doing this kind of stuff. And possibly the, the biggest challenge is really just having the time and the hardware resources to actually do this properly. And especially in the effects, again, there's, there's a lot of studios that are already using AI for various things like Thanos' face rig in Avengers Endgame or uh, doing sketch lines in Spider-Verse. And in the long run, AI technology is going to be disruptive in a lot of ways. Uh, driverless cars are probably going to change a lot of things. So it's, it's definitely important as we move to any kind of tech to then consider the ethics of what it's actually going to mean for us in our industry. And I think there's no doubt about the fact that media is going to be produced quite differently <laughs> by the time that we're retirement age. Um, and it's pretty different now compared to what people were doing back when we were born. Uh, but especially in, in, in film production and in games, expectations keep rising and the cost of development keeps rising as well. So the really important thing is that we do keep producing tools because good tools is what allows us to produce good content and avoids crunch and avoids um, excessive costs and studios being shut down and things like that. And AI ultimately allows us to make tools that lets individuals do more. 
and generally as an industry and as studios and as people we've continued to grow and achieve more and do better tools and create better results so to me when with this question arises it seems kind of odd to assume that at some point we'll be like okay let's let's just stop doing more stuff let's fire people and this is enough like generally the more the more we're able to do the more we end up setting out to achieve and actually doing 